it is indeed an honor and privilege to have you here with us at Sapru House Auditorium this afternoon. We have gathered here for the 13th Sapru House UN Lecture on India and the United Nations in a Changing <coughs> World, which will be delivered by His Excellency UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, jointly organized by ICWA and the United Nations. May I take this opportunity to welcome our distinguished guest and eminent persons on the dais. I also extend warm welcome to the diplomatic corps at Delhi, eminent persons, scholars, and academicians who have graciously accepted our invitation to attend this very important lecture in the new year. I especially thank the print and visual media for being present for the Sapru House UN lecture. <coughs> we have an eminent panel for today's lecture. Ambassador Rajiv K. Bhatia, DG ICWA, will give welcome remarks. This will be followed by introductory remarks by Ambassador Chinmay Gare Khan, who will be the chairperson for the event. The 13th Sapru House UN lecture will be delivered by His Excellency UN Secretary General Ban Ki Moon. The vote of thanks will be proposed by Sri Anwar Halim, Joint Secretary, ICWA. The UN Secretary General has kindly consented to take few questions also during the question answer session. However, given the paucity of time, it was agreed that only a few questions written on a piece of cards will be taken as per the wisdom of the chair. <coughs> the cards are provided at your seats and there will be people who can collect it from you. May I now request Ambassador Rajiv K. Bhatia, DG ICWA, to welcome the dignitaries with a bouquet of flowers. Thank you, sir. May I now request Ambassador Rajiv K. Bhatia, DG ICWA, to kindly give his welcome remarks. <coughs> With the permission of the chair, let us now begin the proceedings of this special event. His Excellency, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General of the UN, Ambassador Gare Khan, senior UN officials, Madame Lise Grant, UN Resident Coordinator and UNDP Resident Representative in India, Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, Excellencies, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Indeed, it is a singular honor for the Indian Council of World Affairs to have amidst us the Secretary General of the United Nations. On behalf of the host institution, it is my privilege and pleasure to extend a most cordial and warm welcome to him. We are delighted that Madame Ban is also present on this occasion. I warmly welcome her and also extend a cordial welcome to all of you, dear guests, who have responded to our invitation in such large numbers. This assembly of our governing council members, diplomats, officials, representatives of strategic and academic community, research scholars, students, and media keenly looks forward to listening to a global figure of exceptional stature and accomplishments. As you are aware, the Secretary General will address us shortly. <coughs> the Indian Council of World Affairs is the oldest and a premier foreign policy think tank of India. It has been striving ceaselessly since 1943 to conduct and promote the study, policy research, external dialogue, and various kinds of outreach activities focused on interpreting the world to India and India to the world. In our scheme of things, the United Nations enjoys paramount importance 
given the role it plays in the pursuit of causes central to its raison d'etre. In this context, I'm happy to share with you that ICWA has recently become a member of the United Nations Academic Impact, UNAI. For this, we express our appreciation for the cooperation extended by Shri Ramu Damodaran, Chief, United Nations Academic Impact, UN Secretariat. We intend to cooperate closely with UNAI to support the activities of the United Nations in future. We look forward to the world body celebrating the 70 years of its existence and development in the coming months. As Prime Minister Narendra Modi stated last September, the UN has achieved much in the past seven decades in its mission to end war, prevent conflict, <coughs> maintain peace, feed the hungry, strive to save our planet, and create opportunities for poor children. Its achievements make the UN an indispensable institution for the world. However, as it reaches the historic milestone of the 70th anniversary, the UN faces a vast array of challenges and opportunities in the present century. These can be addressed better by reinventing and reforming it from its 20th century design. We are deeply interested in learning about the Secretary General's vision of the ongoing transitions and changes in the world, how they will impact on the United Nations, and how the UN plans to cope with them. Our chief guest will deliver the Sapuru House UN lecture. He is the eighth Secretary General of the UN, the second from Asia. He has had a distinguished innings in the domain of diplomacy, lasting 37 years with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea. I'm very happy to note that this impressive and fruitful innings began here in New Delhi. His Excellency, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, was serving as the Foreign Minister of the Republic of Korea at the time of his election as the Secretary General in October 2006. He was re-elected to this August position in 2011. The Secretary General is widely seen as the embodiment of the United Nations. He has been constantly engaged in diverse causes such as promoting sustainable development, empowering women, supporting countries facing disasters, generating fresh momentum on peacekeeping, disarmament, arms control, non-proliferation, and also introducing new measures for making the UN more transparent, effective, and efficient. May I also observe how delighted we are at the Sapro House that Ambassador Garek Khan accepted our invitation to chair this meeting. He is one of the most distinguished diplomats of India. He was the country's permanent representative to the UN from 1986-92, after having served in various prestigious positions in India's Ministry of External Affairs, Prime Minister's Office, and diplomatic missions abroad. He was Under Secretary General and Senior Advisor to the UN from 1997-1999, and later Under Secretary General as well as a Special Coordinator in occupied Palestine, Palestinian territory from 1997 to 1999. Ambassador Garek Khan also served as the Special Envoy of the Prime Minister of India for West Asia and Middle East peace process from 2005 to 2009. He is presently the President of Trust of Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts. May I now request you all to put your hands together to welcome our chief guest and the chair.
Thank you. I would now request the chair to conduct the proceedings of this meeting. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. I speak from there. As you wish. I love these meetings because one hears such nice things about oneself in such lectures. Mr. Secretary General, Madam Ban, Director General of ICWA, Excellencies, Ambassador Rasgotra, the Dean of the Indian Diplomatic Service in India, Excellencies, Senior Advisors of the Secretary General, distinguished members of the audience. It is indeed a special and rare privilege to have the benefit of the views and analysis of the challenges facing the international community from the diplomat in chief of the world. You come here, Mr. Secretary General, after attending the meetings of vibrant Gujarat in Gandhinagar. Gujarat is my state also. And I am indeed very proud, not only of the fact that I am from Gujarat or the Prime Minister, this is the second Prime Minister from the state of Gujarat, incidentally, just as you are the second Secretary General from Asia, uh, but of the fact that you took time to attend that important meeting and to contribute to the proceedings of the conference. I know for a fact that your presence there and your address was very widely appreciated and welcomed by all those present there. Mr. Secretary General, we in India are particularly aware and proud that you started your brilliant professional career as a young diplomat of your country in our capital city. And I hope and I'm confident that you have no regret on that score. Diplomats from around the world should note this fact and appreciate it. But if you start your career in Delhi, you're bound to go far. <laughs> Some of us might even believe that you, Mr. Secretary General, ought to and indeed are especially attentive to India's concerns and priorities because of that fact. Your early stay in India, if I might say so, made you appreciate the skills and professional talents of Indian diplomats, if not also of Indian diplomacy, as is evident from your appointment of several Indians as your close senior advisors. This is sincerely appreciated. Ever since you assumed charge of what is described as the most difficult diplomatic job in the world by someone who has no idea of how difficult the job really is, you have consciously and consistently accorded high priority to the needs and concerns of the developing countries to meeting and dealing with the challenges facing them. For, let it be acknowledged, the challenges confronting the United Nations for the most part are the very challenges which the developing countries, including India, is trying and struggling to cope with. Poverty elimination, malnutrition, diseases such as the Ebola and pandemic, climate change, environment degradation, and so on. Yes, climate change will affect the whole world and will not respect national frontiers. But the fact remains that it is the developing nations which are and will be most vulnerable to the ravages of global warming. You have also, Mr. Secretary General, been deeply preoccupied with the human suffering and tragedies such as the Darfur massacres. I remember how you personally visited the region several times appointed special representatives and kept the attention of the international community and United Nations focused 
on that devastating catastrophe. Similarly, you have devoted extraordinary and needed attention to the Ebola crisis. Your Deputy Secretary General and my good friend, Ambassador Jan Eliasson, I know for a fact, has rendered and continues to render invaluable leadership under your guidance in dealing with this menace. One cannot but include in the list of challenges the ever escalating havoc being perpetrated by terrorists. Terrorism has assumed truly global dimensions and has afflicted all countries, rich and poor alike, and calls for genuine international cooperation. The Paris attacks of last week have dramatically and tragically brought out the fact of interdependence among nations in this vital sphere. The United Nations has been playing a very useful role in this area, and you, Mr. Secretary General, have attached great importance to it. Member states are reluctant to share information and intelligence at their disposal with the United Nations. I have some personal experience of this when I served in the United Nations. There is one phenomenon, however, with which India is perhaps uniquely concerned, namely cross-border cross -border terrorist attacks. Mr. Secretary General, you will no doubt enlighten us with your views and analysis on the topic of your choice, and we keenly and with a sense of anticipation look forward to listening to you. But if you permit me, I'd like to make you a special request. Since the end of the Cold War, fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and dissolution of the Soviet Union in December 91, the world has been in a state of transition. Some statesmen were talking at the time of a new world order, an order incidentally in which the United Nations was expected to play an increasingly important role. No one could predict how long the period of transition would last, but very few people anticipated it would last this long. I recall most diplomats in the delegates' lounge were speaking with some sense of nostalgia of a sort of balance that prevailed for several decades and that would now be missed in the new world order. For a few years, people were talking of Pax Americana. Recently, there is talk of Pax Sinica, or for more accurately, Pax Americana Sinica, the so-called G2. Equally, there is a sense of apprehension as to where the Sino-US competition in what appears to be the onset of another Cold War would lead. For the worst mistake one can make is to be complacent and assume that there will never be another war again. <coughs> it is difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. But you, Mr. Secretary General, are uniquely placed in your vantage position, your vast experience, your frequent personal interaction with world leaders, to look ahead at least a few years to share with us your sense of where the world is going. Do you expect the world to experience more tension in the years and decades ahead? How long will the vital region of Middle East or West Asia continue to be unstable? Should we expect more conflicts between and within states? Must we abandon all hope for a more cooperative, more collaborative discourse among member states of the United Nations? Please forgive me if I have overstepped my function as the chair for this event, but I could not resist the temptation to, to exploit your visit to the full. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Secretary, and thank you all. Your Excellency, Ambassador Chinmaya Garekan, Chair of the Indian Council of World Affairs, Your Excellency, Ambassador Rajiv Patia, uh, Director General of Indian Council on World Affairs, uh, Sri Anwar Halim, Joint Secretary, uh, Sri Ashok uh, Mukherjee, Permanent Representative of United, uh, India to United Nations, uh, Sri uh, Swarup, Joint Secretary, and distinguished members of the Diplomatic Corps, 
Your Excellency, it's a great uh, pleasure. Thank you for your time to participate in this uh, meeting. And I'd like to also thank all senior uh, distinguished ambassadors of Indian Foreign Service and my colleagues uh, traveling with me and UN country team, our re resident coordinator. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to uh, participate and share some thoughts of my own views, uh, how international community and United Nations are working uh, to address all these issues. Ambassador Garikan has just given me quite the challenging, uh, challenging uh, questions even before we enter into uh, Q&A. Uh, I will keep in mind how I can answer, but I think you should know uh, much better than I know. As a Secretary General, I've been addressing a lot of different group of uh, audiences, starting from politicians, professors, and senior diplomats and scientists and business communities. The, one of the difficult audience, uh, audiences is like yourselves, a group of uh, senior uh, diplomatic uh, personalities. Uh, because to my mind, uh, there should be nothing which you do not know what I know. That's my problem. If somebody, if I, if I address some business group of people or some other politicians, then I should say very proudly something which they may not know what I know. Uh, but uh, since we have been working in the same profession, uh, but maybe I may be doing a little more than what you are doing, than what you are doing. Uh, because I'm dealing at this time some current uh, issues, uh, including some future issues too. And I really uh, am happy to be back to uh, New Delhi. And I must uh, you know, uh, my relationship with uh, India, uh, as Ambassador Bhatia said, uh, I think what I'm here uh, started from here uh, 40, uh, 43 years ago, uh, 72. Then, since then, uh, I have been visiting India many times. I told them at that time, when I was leaving here, 75, uh, I'm leaving half of my heart. You know a very famous uh, Frank Sinatra story, I left my heart in New Delhi. Yeah? <laughs> I'm returning regularly to check uh, whether my half of my heart is uh, properly functioning. <laughs> <laughs> my name, uh, Ban, surname Ban, uh, you know, literally speaking in Korean, that means a half. Of course, there are some other better meaning, but half. Somebody called me half a pan or something like this. Whenever I come back to New Delhi, I become full man. <laughs> this is uh, what I can tell you. This, um, I feel really a happy, special connection. Now, in addition to my personal career, professional career, I have some family, a family career, uh, which uh, most of you know, so I do not uh, repeat. Uh, I just met Indian in-laws today, uh, just before coming here. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great uh, privilege for me to address this uh, Sapuru House. Um, nearly 60 years ago, my distinguished uh, pre predecessor, Dag Hamashult, I understand, he visited this council and he spoke passionately, if I may quote at that time what he said, I quote, the weakness of one is the weakness of all and the strength of one is the strength of all. That's what uh, uh, still uh, rings true, still rings true. That is why I'm asking all world leaders, let's work together closely as one team. So UN really uh, tries to work 
as one team. Uh, it looks like the United Nations is a loose, very loose, big organization. Uh, sometimes I do not even understand uh, what exactly their mandates are. Oh, there are so many specialized agencies and funds and programs. They are scattered all around the world. It seems very loose, uh, but uh, since my days as Secretary General, my motto is that one United Nations think and act and deliver as one. That's what we say, uh, T-A-O, -T uh, deliver as one. Uh, this is our uh, catchphrase. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living in an era of test and challenge. Billions of people uh, struggle in poverty, including some 500 million people in India. Uh, globally, uh, there are more displaced people than at any time since the end of World War II. Uh, terrorist networks spread far fear and instability across the continents. We have seen such a terrible things happen in Paris. <clears throat> in terms of number of people killed, uh, I think we have seen so many places, uh, most recently in Peshawar in Pakistan, 140 uh, school children were killed. But 12 journalists and policemen were killed in Paris. But they were striking at the heart of our freedom, the freedom of expression. That is why millions of people marched together with uh, so many uh, world leaders in, uh, on Sunday. If not the uh, Gujarat, the uh, vibrant Gujarat, I would have been there myself. But unfortunately, I couldn't, uh, I thought that this is uh, more important. In any way, there's a lot of religious, racial, and ethnic intolerance, which fuel conflicts and distort and development. At the same time, climate change is impacting uh, whole our lives. The climate change is approaching much, much faster than one may think. Humanity can overcome these challenges by working in our shared interest, working as one, to have a strength of one become strength of all. This is not a burdensome task. It is a rich opportunity. When I lived here more than 40 years ago, I have seen, since then, I have seen India's impressive advances uh, over the decades. I see this country's great global potential. Uh, today, uh, I'll uh, focus on three major roles India can play in addressing all these issues. First, India as a driver for peace in the region and the world. Second, India as a champion of human rights. And third, India as a leader on clean development, clean sustainable development. Those are three issues which covers all your lives, and all the sp spectrums of for our human beings. In this here for our common future, India has a great role and great deal to contribute and stands to benefit enormously. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me begin with um, regional uh, security. The world is looking to India to help advance peace, stability, and prosperity in South Asia. A secure regional environment will also help India reach its ambitious development goals. Regional stability requires engagement and collaboration. I welcome India's leadership in deepening cooperation in South Asia. As the world's largest democracy, India has important lessons for others. Across the region, 
Political leaders must put aside long-standing grievances and seek new ways to peacefully end old disputes. This is especially the case for India and Pakistan. The continued instability in Pakistan and Afghanistan is not only the responsibility of those nations. They need regional engagement to build stronger institutions, support economic growth, and foster better relations. Uh, those challenges should be addressed through such initiatives as the Istanbul process and growing bilateral and multilateral partnership uh, agreements. I encourage India's leaders to remain invested in helping Afghanistan to develop, including through education exchanges. Afghanistan's security challenges cannot be solved only through military efforts. An Afghan-led political process focused on peace and reconciliation is essential. And it needs regional support, like from India. More broadly, South Asia faces the grave danger of nuclear weapons. Each addition to the arsenals raises the risks of nuclear nightmare. India and Pakistan were among the more than 150 countries that reached this conclusion at three conferences on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. I am troubled by the lack of disarmament globally. Other nuclear states have announced limitations and reductions, but in some regions, including this one, arsenals are growing more diverse and more sophisticated. Other nuclear states have declared an end to their production of nuclear materials for weapons, but again in some regions, Including this one, the stockpiles are growing. Other nuclear states have proclaimed moratoria on nuclear tests, but other nuclear states, including in South Asia, have not signed the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, a CTBT. Governments are investing in weapons while cutting their health budgets. I call on India to renew its leadership on nuclear disarmament. This country made the first call uh, for a comprehensive test ban in 1954 and in 1988, India promoted an ambitious plan uh, for a nuclear weapon free world. And today, India has a solemn responsibility to help South Asia uh, stop developing nuclear arsenals. Uh, this is all the more urgent in our era of rising violent extremism and radicalism. Terrorists are using the internet, especially social media, to recruit young people, raise funds and spread their narrative of hate. I have repeatedly condemned the terrorism that takes innocent lives. The world stood in solidarity with India in the aftermath of the devastating and appalling terrorist attacks in Mumbai in 2008. The world was again horrified last month by the savage and cowardly attack on innocent school children and educators in Peshawar. And yesterday, the world rallied in Paris. The United Nations has a comprehensive global counterterrorism strategy, which India fully supports. I welcome India's cooperation with the United Nations on counterterrorism. And I urge India to work with its neighbors on the strategy's four pillars, that is, addressing conditions that allow terrorism spread, preventing and combating it, and building states' capacity, and ensuring respect for human rights and the rule of law. 
Now, let me turn to global security. India has shown its faith in a collective approach through its generous contribution to the United Nations peacekeeping operations. Today, more than 8,000 Indian peacekeepers serve in UN operations. I have seen their courage, and I have honored their sacrifice. 158 Indian peacekeepers have lost their lives while serving the United Nations. We are doing everything possible to protect our blue helmet. Two out of three, two out of every three peacekeepers serves in conditions of ongoing conflict where there is either a fragile peace agreement or none at all. In places like Mali, armed groups are joining forces with transnational criminal networks and terrorist organizations. To address these threats, protect civilians and safeguard human rights, we need a consistent strategy that is fully supported by the international community and the Security Council. Our troops need the right equipment, personnel, training, and expertise. More than that, they need the backing of countries that can influence warring parties. We are improving peacekeeping with a solid result. We have focused our missions, introduced effective new technologies, and broadened our base of, base of contributors. But there are still major challenges. We need better funding, training, and equipment. We need to improve command and control. Our troops and police must carry out challenging mandates with a full resolve. We need to handle ever more complex mandates. And we need stronger political support overall. That is why recently I have established a high-level independent panel to conduct a comprehensive review of peace operations. One of its members is retired Indian Lieutenant General Abhijit, Abhijit Guha, who brings years of experience in UN peacekeeping. This panel will provide recommendations uh, to help the United Nations with India better serve people in need. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now turn to the second area where India has a key role to play, uh, human rights. Diversity is one of India's most outstanding features. It is home to a mosaic of peoples from different cultures, ethnic groups, religions, and languages. In India and all countries, individuals are born free and equal. Peoples deserve respect, dignity, and security regardless of their ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, or gender identity. <coughs> the United Nations defends those rights everywhere, north, south, east, and west. Development models must reach all groups. Inclusive group growth brings shared prosperity. India has already lifted millions of, uh, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, and it can bring the benefits of inclusive growth to millions more. Yesterday, I visited uh, Mahatma Gandhi's Sabarmati Ashram in Gujarat. I was uh, deeply moved by how they are conserving and teaching Gandhi's let and um, preserving Gandhi's letters and other precious artifacts. And I reflected on. Tribals, tribals and others still face discrimination, especially the women and girls. 
In too many communities, religious minorities also suffer. We must continue Gandhi's battle for equality. Since young, as a young diplomat, I have been visiting Razgat uh, many times. Whenever VIPs came, I escorted to them. And as a Secretary General, as a Foreign Minister, I paid my own tribute. Then I really tried to practice, and like most, these social, seven social sins, what uh, Gandhi said. If uh, politicians, uh, businessmen, or scientists, or whatever professions people, if they practice what he said, I think this world will be a most harmonious, and there will be no conflict, no conflict, no corruptions, or whatever. I am just uh, admired. At that time already, he taught us uh, to keep all this. Uh, when I uh, went to uh, Sabarmati uh, Gandhi Ashram yesterday, again, I was uh, humbled and inspired. Yesterday in my speech, I told the leaders, world leaders, that let his teachings inspire all of us, inspire all of us. You know, addressing many uh, difficult challenges, I think education is one of the keys. Uh, schools should be gardens of global citizenship, not battlegrounds of divisive ideologies. The world faces global pandemic of violence against women, including the heinous crimes of rape and sexual abuse. India has a special challenge. The UN will do everything possible to support Government's effort to prevent this violence, protect women, provide for victims, and punish the perpetrators. I started a global campaign called He For She campaign uh, to change mindset and mobilize men for together equality, men for gender equality. I thank Prime Minister Modi for his support. No country can advance as long as its women are held back. I have been saying that uh, while in our world we use a lot of different resources, technologies, the least utilized resource, resource in our human lives is women. The half, more than half of global population uh, are women. Then it is only natural that uh, if we cannot give more, then at least they should be given equal, equal treatment, equal status. That is why, as a Secretary General, I have been promoting this gender equality, gender empowerment. Uh, I try to lead by example so that uh, other world leaders and business leaders could uh, emulate the United Nations uh, example. I'm proud to tell you that United Nations has changed a lot uh, since I uh, became Secretary General. And uh, Lakshmi Puri, she is now uh, deputy head of this UN Women. And it was I who established this UN Women. There was some uh, fractured uh, department or offices, small or big, I just combined all of them together, all of them together, establishing one big, uh, huge uh, department. I need the uh, Indian government uh, strong support uh, for this uh, UN women. And I approach the many civil society groups across India that work often without resources or recognition to empower women and minority groups. Two years ago, Justice Verma delivered valuable recommendations to end violence against women in India. I count on the government to act on them. India has long displayed a commitment to gender equality. 
the world can thank a daughter of India, Dr. Hansa Mehta, for replacing the phrase in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. He said, uh, all men are born free and equal. Now it's changed. All human beings are born free and equal in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. How appropriate, how fitting it is. I call for India to promote gender tolerance and non-discrimination where the full participation of women and all minority groups lead to sustainable uh, peace. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the third area where I see enormous potential in India is sustainable development. When it comes to sustainable development uh, or climate change, I become much more energized than uh, talking about the security issues. Because I see more hope, more possibility in our work and United Nations contribution to a sustainable uh, development. The world is now shaping a new agenda to succeed the Millennium Development Goals. I count on India to engage fully in this process. I welcome Make in India. I thought it was Made in India. Now it's a Make in India. It's a very uh, good uh, policy of uh, Pr Prime Minister Modi. This is a national program to turn this country into a manufacturing hub of the world. And I saw the possibility yesterday in Gujarat. Uh, the vibrant Gujarat the summit meeting through this it was really uh, vibrating, not only Gujarat, I think the whole world is now uh, vibrating with this uh, dynamism and vibration. I would add two words more into this uh, make in India. Make it green in India. What about it? Make it, uh, make it green in India. By respecting the env environment, India can grow economically while enjoying greater human progress overall. Prime Minister Modi rightly gives priority to creating smart cities, 100 smart cities, and boosting energy security. These are also central to international action on climate change. Climate action can power growth, reduce poverty, improve health, and increase energy security. Uh, renewable energy offers huge business opportunities. I saw this yesterday at the Canal Top solar power plant in Gujarat. Energy efficiency reduces emissions and pollution while increasing productivity. Uh, this year, the world must seize the chance uh, to achieve a meaningful global agreement uh, at the Paris Climate Conference. Uh, that agreement can trigger large investment flows, spark innovation, and push low-carbon technologies into global markets. India can be a major part uh, of this new flow of goods and resources. Ladies and gentlemen, India has grown remarkable global leadership from Gandhi's time until today. I applaud India for its commitment to the United Nations. India is ranked at the top of our two contributing countries, our corporate global compact members, our contributors to the UN Democracy Fund, and many other UN initiatives. At the same time, the challenges here uh, mirror our global challenges, uh, poverty, gender inequality, discrimination, environmental degradation, extremism, and other security threats. The United Nations is mobilizing the countries to rise to these challenges in this, our 70th anniversary year. 
2015 is a time for global action. If we rise to the moment, we can address suffering that has engulfed our planet for too long. We can reach out to youth and raise a new generation of global citizens, especially in India, which has the most young people of any country in the world. We can grasp a new future of dignity and security for all. The great poet Rabindranath Tagore uh, called on people to transcend uh, their differences. He said, I quote, let us announce to the world that the light of the morning has come, not for entrenching ourselves behind the barriers, but for meeting in mutual understanding and trust on the common field of cooperation, uh, end of quote. Ladies and gentlemen, I really count on India to be part of our transformative push to realize uh, this vision uh, for the people of this remarkable country, India, and our human family of the world. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. May I now request the audience to kindly give the questions to the person. Yeah, I have to go to the uh, house for our meeting with that. Maybe I'll have uh, one or two. Yeah, I have yeah. 440. I have to transport it. I have a time to 440. 440, you have to move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Well, happily for us, uh, the Secretary General has a, a few minutes uh, which he can share with us and answer a few questions. I have received a, a number of questions, in fact. Uh, The first question that we will take is the following. The United Nations has set the deadline of 2015 to meet Millennium Development Goals. What do you feel are the biggest challenges to meet this deadline and how optimistic are you that at least some of these goals will be met by the deadline? One by one? Why don't you like to? This is a very, uh, very practical uh, question. Uh, deadline also falls, of course, falls on December 31st. Uh, we've been working during the last 14 years. But I have to admit uh, that we may not be able to meet all the eight goals which have been. Uh, promised by the world leaders in 2000. Uh, but it's also true that uh, through these Millennium Development Goals, uh, we have been able to meet the first goal to reduce the abject poverty by half uh, by 2015. That has already been achieved uh, by 2010. Uh, according to World Bank, uh, we reduced the half of the poor people from this earth. But unfortunately, with the continuing international global f financial crisis, which happened in late 2009, then hundreds of million people have been pushed back to 
the category of this uh, poverty, then we have to address this issue. Then we have uh, addressed uh, all these diseases. India should be really uh, congratulated upon by eliminate, eradicating polio already uh, four years ago. I was here uh, in 2009. I administered uh, polio vaccine myself uh, together with my wife. At that time, still you had the polio, but you eradicate this uh, from this continent. That is very much uh, important. We have uh, three countries uh, still to, it's almost on the verge of eradicating polio. We reduced a lot of um, potential death from HIV AIDS, and India has made a great contribution in reducing maternal death and children, the child death. Uh, then in 2009, I came here for just the health purpose, and I traveled here and Mumbai and elsewhere. Then for that, you, you have to uh, be very much proud. The world has really tried to uh, provide the primary, uh, primary education to all the school age children. But unfortunately, still, we have uh, 58 million children who are out of school. But all, all this, overall, I think we made the good progress quite significant progress in addressing Millennium Development Goals. Then we have to admit the reality that we cannot do it. That is why member states have been working very hard uh, during the last uh, several years to shape the post-2015 development agenda with a set of sustainable development goals. Uh, they have identified uh, uh, 17 goals the Millennium Development Goals has eight goals. Now, this Sustainable Development Goals is going to address both developing and developed world, uh, covering all the spectrums of our life, particularly three dimensions, social, economic, and environment, uh, to make this um, uh, planet Earth a really sustainable one. Uh, that will be a huge task this year. Uh, I'm expecting world leaders to come to the United Nations on this occasion of the 70th anniversary, uh, then to adopt and declare another vision targeting uh, 2030, 2030 uh, including this addressing climate change. Then by 2030, we'll have uh, eradicated, we'll have eradicated poverty. And we'll have to provide, we'll have had provide uh, secondary education to all the, all, the ch all the people, school children around the world. I think we can do it. And we have to have provide energy access, access to, uh, universal access to electricity. The Prime Minister Modi yesterday announced that uh, you will have a 24-hour electricity. Our target, by 2022, we will have, by 2030, 7 billion people, maybe by that time, 8 billion people will have access, and they will have safe drinking water and sanitation, and all this will have to be addressed. And this, our vision is that to create a world where nobody is left behind in a sustainable way. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sik. There are several questions relating to one of your favorite uh, subjects, the right of sustainable development. And the questions boil down to the following. How would you ensure balance between the right of development of the, for the poor vis-a-vis -vis emissions control? Is there a conflict between the two, and how do you reconcile mm -hmm. the two? Okay. This is part of uh, sustainable development. Um, addressing this, making this world environmentally sustainable is a hugely important part of this uh, sustainability, global sustainability. Of course, countries are 
country's capacity uh, are all different. Even the t today's meeting with the foreign minister, I, I, I asked India to take a leadership role. I know that India has a um, lot of problems in the greenhouse gas emissions. You still have to depend on fossil fuels. But at the same time, you have uh, innovation, innovative uh, technologies, and you have a hugely uh, well-educated uh, human resources while you have to address at least 300, 400 million uh, poor people. Therefore, how to balance development and addressing this environment issue is a huge, a huge problem. Uh, there is um, uh, a principle which uh, we have agreed is that common uh, but differentiated uh, responsibilities. This greenhouse gas emissions, climate change has been caused mostly by a developed world during, since the Industrial uh, Revolution. At the same time, we have to admit that the countries like China or even India, even though the ratio is much different, much lower, then they have contributed significantly to this current greenhouse gas emissions. China is now number one emitting countries. Therefore, how to balance this is a very, a very delicate, a politically sensitive, and economically, again, a very sensitive one. Uh, I hope that when member states commit themselves, their plan of action, uh, which will be submitted uh, by end of March this year, and I expect that India will do it by the end of June, then we should uh, address the level of uh, difference of um, capacity, resources, and the level of their contribution to, uh, to this current, uh, current uh, state. Uh, I hope that negotiators, negotiators will address all this issue in a comprehensive way, in a balancing and equitable way. Yeah. Here is a question which might uh, interest you, and I'm sure will be of interest to some people in the audience. What do you think the United Nations can do to help strengthen efforts to save wildlife and promote respect for non-human species? Mm -hmm. There's a preserving all species, uh, all different species, and particularly wildlife uh, whose lives are endangered by a reckless uh, a poaching and killing and hunting. Uh, this is one of the serious uh, problems which we have to address. There's a lot of organized crimes and corruptions and uh, uh, smugglings are involved in this. Uh, even uh, those, uh, when they are combined with uh, drug, uh, drugs, uh, then it even sometimes uh, creates a lot of uh, social, uh, political instability of a country. Uh, first of all, it's important that all we have to, uh, as, a, as a matter of principle, in addressing this uh, planet Earth, where all the species, uh, whether it's um, wildlife or biodiversities and human, uh, should be able to coexist in, an, in a sustainable way, a sustainable way. Uh, that is a very important one. Then we have to uh, go by, the, first of all, effective control. You have to abide by the all rules of laws. And there are many uh, conventions, international conventions, uh, to protect these endangered uh, species, endangered, uh, what is known as CITES. But in practice, it's very difficult uh, in enforcing, enforcing by the government uh, to prevent uh, all those uh, poachings and smugglings. 
the United Nations is very w closely working with the wildlife uh, uh, government as well as uh, NGOs like uh, Wild Federa WWF, Wildlife uh, Federations. Uh, and I think we need to really uh, work together on this matter. Yeah. May we take one more question? Yes. 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 The United Nations was born in the backdrop of interstate conflicts. But the nature of conflict has changed to intrastate conflicts now. What is the significance of the United Nations in such a scenario? Uh, le let me uh, combine your, in this question together with your uh, first question. <laughs> uh, I was hoping this, you would come to that. This is quite uh, broader, uh, much more uh, difficult uh, questions, uh, how to handle all these um, uh, conflicts. And this is my ninth year, and I have served, completed my eighth year as a Secretary General. Uh, one day I asked uh, one of the very senior, long-serving UN staff uh, who served at the rank of Under Secretary General, he served at least uh, longer than four decades. I asked, have you ever seen during your time, and including now, any time when there were so many conflicts were happening all at once? I can name at least 10 hot burning areas. And not any, any time in the past, have we seen the environmental degradation as such, as we are experiencing now. And therefore, in all th spectrum of our life, uh, we are living in a very challenging era. Uh, we are now being tested, as I said in, at the beginning. Then let me just uh, talk about all these uh, conflicts. Because of the lack of um, good governance, uh, lack of uh, rule of law, and lack of uh, support for uh, promotion of uh, human dignity and human rights, then people have become very much unsatisfied with uh, their existing systems. Uh, when I say existing system means their leaders, government leaders or business leaders. I'm not just saying only government political leaders. The whole society has become full of um, mistrust, lack of respect for others. That is why we are now experiencing extremism, radicalization, and uh, in the form of a terrorism. Um, because they are now expressing uh, their anger and grievances through a very violent means. And in many cases, those governments, there are many governments who are not capable uh, to handle these issues. Because in most cases, they are lacking their legitimacy. Legitimacy. They are not being respected by the people. Because what they have been preaching, they have not been practicing. That is why I've been saying always, you should lead by example. What you preach, you should do yourself. You should come forefront in leading your people, leading your organization, or leading your society. When you just talk and you are not doing and ask other people to do, then there is always inequality and uh, there is a pr serious problem of equity issue, a mutual respect issue. That's why we are seeing a lot of problems uh, in Africa, in Asia, and Europe, even in Europe now. As you said at the beginning, the historians and the scholars, they are now expressing some concern about the world we seem to be haunted by uh, this uh, ghost of Cold War. As a Secretary General, it will be extremely sensitive remarks. 
then we lived in Cold War era. Then with the downfall of Berlin Walls and with the dissolution of, dissolve of all this Soviet Union empire, uh, then we been enjoying uh, this, you know, a very uh, a free world. Then there has been serious lack of uh, rule of law, uh, lack of uh, good governance. When there is not the good governance, it creates a lot of problems, accountability, justice problem. When uh, perpetrators are just to walk freely on the broad daylight without being punished, then how can you make sure that uh, you are living in a safe world? That we have to address all this issue. That is part of uh, sustainability, a global sustainability. It's not uh, talking, we are not talking about um, social economic development when it comes to sustainability. We have to talk political sustainability. When everybody's human rights and human dignity are truly protected, and then there will be a true respect for others. When you are treated as a human being, then you will voluntarily, voluntarily contribute to the society, development of the society. Uh, therefore, we have to be very serious uh, on this issue. Uh, what's happening, you see, in Europe now, And when the Security Council members are united, we can deliver a lot the easier way. When the member states, particularly in the Security Council, are not united, it's very much difficult to deliver. Uh, we have been uh, very successful in uh, delivering the promise to uh, eliminate the Syrian chemical weapons. But when it comes to political issues, we have not been able to resolve this Syrian crisis. We have not been able to resolve this Ukrainian situation at this time. Then people are watching. People are watching. Then when leaders and when leaders are not the practicing themselves, lead by example, then people are watching and they will let the follow. And that's what we are seeing uh, many conflicts in Africa. And that is really uh, troubling me as a Secretary General. Of course, there is a high expectation on the United Nations. Why United Nations is not being able to uh, handle or address all these issues? I'm humbled always by this kind of uh, expectation as well as uh, sometimes a criticism. Uh, but there is not a single country, not a single organization, which can address this alone. That's why from the beginning, when the strength of one can become a strength of all, and weakness of one can be weakness of all. Now, we should overcome this weakness of all we have to change this strength of all. And I really count on all the member states, on the, all the people, not only political leaders, even s just the private citizens, they have to be united for this a better world. We have to make a, this world a better for everybody, where nobody is being left behind, where nobody, nobody's human rights is abused. That's the priority goal of the United Nations. I'm just asking and urging world, leader, world leaders to unite and to understand the seriousness and urgency of this uh, crisis at this time. I thank you very much. Thank you. May I now request Sri Arunwar Halim, Joint Secretary ICWA, to propose vote of thanks. Excellencies, esteemed guests and colleague, it is indeed in honor for ICWA that His Excellency, Secretary General, United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, 
has agreed and delivered the 13th Sapru House United Nations Lectures on a theme which is very close to us. Sir, your address has added very valuable inputs to our understanding on the issue and regarding that India and UN can play together. UN has become perhaps much more important and relevant to all of us. And I am but tempted to reiterate that the Indian ethos of Vasudhev Kutumbakam, which envisages a global family, and the ideals of Sulhe Kul, which looks for peaceful coexistence for all, are perhaps in sync and in harmony with the ideals you have addressed and spoken for. I deeply thank our esteemed guest, UN Secretary General. This will be an important input to all of us and we'll remember it for a long time. I also take this opportunity to express our sincere thanks to the chairperson of today, Ambassador C.R. Gare Khan, who has chaired the event. I take this opportunity also to thank the DGICWA, Sri R.K. Bhatia, and UN Resident Coordinator Lise Grant for the conceptualization of today's event. And I also thank everyone from the UN support staff, ICWA staff, who have worked hard to make this event a success. May I request all of you to join me in a thunderous applause. Thank you, everyone. Avoid inconvenience to our guests and audience. May I request the audience at the back to use gates two and three, while those at the front may use exit gate one. On behalf of ICWA, I welcome you all for a high tea. Which